and it's live from open ed in autumn take it away <laughs> oh sorry martin somebody on site again still so hi everyone um should we get the people here to introduce themselves first so i'm martin Mello from the open university i'm terry green from fleming college i'm new here so i'm the voice of I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm here to learn from you. <laughs> I'm Kristen Eshelman. I'm Director of Digital Innovation at Davidson College. I'm Christina Hendricks. I teach philosophy at the University of British Columbia at Vancouver. I'm Chuck Pearson. I'm Associate Professor of Natural Sciences at Tusculum College in Tennessee. And I'm J.R. Dingwall. I'm from the University of Alberta. And we'll have, we can have our virtual guests, uh, virtual participants uh, introduce themselves. Mo? Hi, Mo Pelzel. I'm digital pedagogy designer at Austin College, which is not in Austin, but in Sherman, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Lisa and Sarah? Oh, hi, I'm Lisa Hammersheim. I'm a doctoral student at Athabasca University. And I'm Sarah Hammersheim. I'm also a doctoral student at Athabasca University. And Ma Mandy and then Maha. I'm muted. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I used to be at the Open University. Now I'm building a house in Washougal in Washington and keeping my hand in by coming and joining and listening into what's going on. And I'm Mahabeli. I'm at the American University in Cairo, and this is Little Hoda. <laughs> Say hi to Helen. Hello. Say hi to Martin. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> if she sees Autumn, she's not going to leave, so we better not show her Autumn. <laughs> okay. We we had a chance to listen and hear gardeners um, talk this morning. Thanks for the periscoping that happened and the the Twitter stream that happened through. Um, so what have what have you picked up so far that you find interesting or kind of challenging your thinking on open ed? I, I think a, a theme that I've noticed today is like probably just because Garner planted this seed of insights. But uh, Mike Caulfield uh, talked a little bit about choral explanations. If you've seen his blog post about it, it's like 15 pages long, but very worth the read. Um, and how students would use explanations for like concepts is just another way that we can get at those kinds of insights. So it doesn't, like it's not just about blogging and it's not just about um, like writing papers, but maybe like choral explanations. And even the textbook has something that we layer those on top of. So I think insights has been a much more. Yeah, it was also the choral explanations talk, and the thing that I, I was having trouble getting my head around it. But he explained it well. It's just sort of people giving different examples and different explanations for the same thing, but from a different perspective, and they can each provide a part of the picture, but you put it all together into a, a clearer picture. And you can triangulate, yes. Yeah. And what I really loved about that was that you can put it inside an open textbook. So the students can read stuff that's really hard to understand, um, but then there's all these other explanations from other students or from other people outside, and it's all in the textbook. And then you can add your own, you know, just made it much more, well, it was open in a different way, open to, different revisions in a way. Yeah, that'd be a great um, a choral explanation for if we go to the API one. Oh, it's oh the API yeah, one, it. yeah. We need that for APIs. Yes, we do. A huge list of explanations. I think a lot of the theme that we're getting out of today is empowering um, at learners, not even necessarily just students, but learners in general with information, with the resources to do their own thing to have control over their own information. Um, and I think that's a real dominant theme in everything from Gardner's keynote going forward. But, but here's my uh, problem, not a problem with that because I agree with everything Gardner said wholeheartedly. Uh, but the challenge I think we have is how do we prove that that is a better method? So we're up against, you know, Gardner spent a lot of time talking about, if you didn't see it, um, pushing back against learning outcomes, which is something I would love to see us do. But how do we prove 
that this other way of teaching, you know, that this insight approach is effective, that they're learning, because we're always going to be up against that battle uh, with learning analytics and, and other folks who can bring data to the, to the table. How do we demonstrate that we merit the time to, to take to demonstrate that that's a better learning outcome? Because like Gardner said, this isn't something that happens immediately. This isn't something that happens very quickly. It happens over a great deal of time. Yeah, the unfortunate thing for us is we can say it, but I think we have to prove it. Well, no, we've made it. We well, no, we've made it when we use the word savvy. You know, yeah. <laughs> as the learning outcome. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but it's not like anyone has proven really that learning outcomes do help learning. So I'm not really sure why we have to prove the opposite. I mean, I understand that question, but it's not like the other one was really helping. Well, they, they, unless you're proving the really simple outcomes, like the really low level yeah, ones, the right, very right. high level ones design you to the things you can measure. Yeah. And that's specifically how you design learning mm -hmm. outcomes, is you design right. them so they can be measurable, you measure, and then you say you fit them, and now you're done, right? You're not even questioning the whole process. Right, right. and there's no space for the rest. Yeah, uh, that's the concern that I have with it. So I, that's why I have to prove it on some level. Because it looks like proof on the other side. Exactly. Let's <laughs> we'll start with 50% measurable ones, and then you can have 50% of them goosey-goosey. Words like savvy openness emergence <laughs> well or you can make your the, the measurable ones the really silly ones and get rid of those the first two weeks of class and then focus on the ones that you want to do <laughs> don't tell my boss i said that <laughs> did people in the did the virtual participants get to hear did anybody get to hear his talk i i was able to watch a bit of it um when it was being periscoped yeah it was interesting what were, your, what were your takeaways? I got lost in the uh, search for the, um, what was the Google search that he had everybody doing? The Eureka Hunt? The yeah, Eureka, Eureka Hunt. Hunt. <laughs> got, got, didn't get past the Eureka Hunt. <laughs> Can someone explain what that is? I, I couldn't watch this talk. What was that? It, the Eureka Hunt, the story was about a firefighter who saved himself through insight, but wasn't able to save the others. But then he talked about an article about that, and then an assignment for students about the article, about the story, <laughs> and how the rubric kind of didn't allow for insight in the responses, because they were trying to meet the rubric. That's how it took it kind of I even yeah. saw like the title of the assignment as, like that's where I thought the initial problem was. I didn't even think about the rubric until you brought it up, but it's like, as soon as I saw summary and response assignments, was like, oh, that's a really innovative title. <laughs> it's like, I know exactly what I'm going to get from students if I call something a summary and response to this article. That is already is a formula. Just drop the word insight into the answer six times and you're probably good. Yeah, yeah. it's like when we ask students to reflect. Like, I, I thought about this and I'm now reflecting and I have reflected. Yes. Yes. Give me the marks. Yes. <laughs> 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 but when we're students, that's that's how we do, isn't it? That's that we're trying to meet a standard somebody has come out and set. Um, and 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 from the student's perspective, I just gotta get this assignment done. Get me out of this. And it can also be scary because your grades are are riding on something, and if you don't actually have a clear sense of what you're supposed to be doing it can be really scary so sure. so the idea of sort of loosey goosey might be like questionable from a student perspective unless you really set it up and you explain why you're doing it well and that was that was the question i was having or a little debate on twitter and you know, students really want that scaffolding at least that's my experience i'm doing two r d courses right now that are very open-ended and they hate it yeah. <laughs> and I, but then you know so i was pushing back a little bit and then i think it was amy collier or someone pushed back on me and said but why do they crave it? Why aren't we asking that question? Yeah, yeah. That was a good question. I had one more. That sense of learning as iteration that, uh, you know, you, you fail and you fail and you fail, but then you get marked on the, the best piece. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, presumably we're also talking about whether part of taking part in your own learning from a student's perspective is also being able to judge how you're you're doing and um so therefore having a rubric or knowing what it is that you're being judged on mm -hmm. should theoretically be helping you to judge yourself and figure out how you're doing yourself so 
it seems one has to be careful not to throw out the bath water with the baby, or is it the baby with the bath? Water? <laughs> yeah, the baby with the bath. Water. Yeah. I, th I was I was curious about whether I know I was I was at Open Ed with with some of you last year, and um, I think one of the things that came over the last year was that everyone was talking about textbooks, open textbooks, but the, the conversations about other parts of um, the open ed, ed landscape were getting a bit buried. So I was wondering whether you had any thoughts about that this year, and or whether it's too early to tell. I think the, um, the, the panel this morning and the Carbon Skin would actually require a response to that, that discussion that happened last year. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 it's a different, different mm. yeah. Well, having Robin DeRosa up front, the very part of, the, of that panel and present the stuff that she's been doing at the state. Um, developing that open early American lit text um, and and doing that with student input. Um, she, Robin has a great measure of energy and if you haven't seen a couple of things she's presented online you really need to because she she's persuading me a great deal about open pedagogy just um, to seriously consider that with what I do. So she talked about um, creating the textbook with the students. Right. What do you think of like at our college, we need to develop our faculty development. But if right. faculty get that, oh, faculty to... development textbook, like what do they need to know? And it could be more specific for uh, mm. like a community college or a university mm. or even in different schools. Mm. Kind of popped to my mind, it might be a way for us to what develop kind of, our faculty. Development. What kinds of things are, are going to something like that? Ask for them. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> we're doing that with with graduate students, and we have a TA training program. So we're you know we're trying to help them learn how to teach uh, classes. Um, and we have a we need to create a handbook for our department, and I'm hiring grad students to help write the handbook because they're the ones who who know what did you not know when you started? <laughs> and that you wanted to. And, yeah. So I think that could work. Yeah. Try. Yeah, I know that I've, I've been, when I was, I was doing a master's at the OU, I think Martin saying, <laughs> and um, one of the things that I did when, at the end of it was to go back and talk to students doing it the following year as well, and that, that was, that was uh, a really nice way of kind of passing on the things that we'd learned, not just having to write, but also being invited into a hangout and doing it like that as well. So that was kind of not quite the conversation then. <laughs> Do you guys think that there's some um, some disciplines or some subjects where this can happen more readily than others? Okay. Uh, you know, sciences versus humanities, things like that. So I had tweeted out something about like uh, Robin mentioned like every course can do this like open textbook student written thing, and immediately somebody from my uh, from a natural sciences background, mm -hmm. which I kind of expected. But, was that you that I That was so me. Oh, yes. there we go. So, <laughs> and, which which was really expected because I've run into that into that before, yeah. but I think there are still some examples of it. And it doesn't I think sometimes when it comes to the what does this thing look like, sometimes we focus too much on the artifact. So it's like, oh, I'm I have to write like an entire textbook while in natural sciences. But the how do I run getting students? But work. someone like Karen can I don't know how to say her name. Karen Kang Lozi? She does that in biology. She's got I think open some kind of open something. Well, I'm going to be one of the online buddies for the conversation with Karen on and site. Savannah um, on Friday. So you don't think that's coming up? That might be coming up. <laughs> I think yeah. it is. that is gonna come up, but uh. money, money, money. Please watch the virtuallyconnecting.org page for more of these conversations. <laughs> Get a chip for that. Dang right. Every session has to put a plug for another session. <laughs> I think the thing about different disciplines, I was thinking that with um, Gardner's thing about insight. So does, mm -hmm. does insight apply equally across mm -hmm. disciplines? Because, you know, if you're doing quantum physics, that's kind of pretty hard stuff to have. Uh, you might have insight into understanding it, but it's a different thing, I think, from. Kind of having an insight into 
the creative writing process. Right. Um, in, yeah. Insight yeah. takes different applications. The, the insights you get to some of the fundamental quantum ideas, those are big deals for a student to have, even if multiple people before you have had them. Yeah. Reinventing the wheel is an important way for you to own that knowledge for yourself. And so there's a lot of value in that process. Well, and I'm, I'm going to throw a little arts bias in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I think that integration piece, right? So I'm not sure right. it matters if it's in every discipline as long as is that integration mm -hmm. across the disciplines happens, mm -hmm. and that's all about insight. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine. Insight absolutely means different things to dis different disciplines. Yes, it does. Yeah. Just for ed tech, your insight to different uses of right. combinations of right. the things we have available to us. I don't have any right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that. <laughs> you need to go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I learned this morning. <laughs> Good weather, just yes, yes, we heard about insight uh, equals walk or walk equals insight. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it previews the, the gamma moments, the gamma yeah, waves in your I brain. Right no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really excited to, to watch this talk from Gardner because I actually did my dissertation on a book entitled Insight by a, a Canadian philosopher. I'm sure Christina's probably heard of him, uh, Bernard Lonergan. Yes, yes. Um, so the, the th just hearing the word insight is very exciting in itself. I, I guess, you know, in terms of the subject matter uh, conversation, it would also depend upon what level you're working at. I mean, you could, you could see advanced students maybe creating textbook chapters more readily than, you know, bio 101 or introductory level type of situations. But even at the introductory level, so I have a colleague at a University of British Columbia who has the students create what he calls learning objects, which is great. It's sort of this throwback to mm -hmm. early, yeah, the mm -hmm. 19 whatever mm -hmm. that learning objects sort of thing. Um, but but they create. It's kind of like choral explanations, but he doesn't do it in quite the same way. Where they create ways to explain to other students the things that they have just learned. So the hard stuff in physics, they create a video or a slide or a diagram, and then they're all uploaded to a WordPress site, and so other students can see. Oh, that's how it works. And they, so, the other students, that yeah, yeah, and yeah. they have to. It's it's one of their that maps to Missouri's work, right? So you spent a decade study on this. Right. And a it new does. learner can explain yes. it better to another new learner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're all first year students. Right. Our college has this thing called the co-curricular record, the CCR. So I always mm -hmm. think of down on the corners. It's like, <laughs> like, like positions where they do something and it go on the record as extra curricular. So if you could, and you can create positions as faculty or staff, but create positions for creating learning objects or mm -hmm. textbook chapters or the ancillary stuff that yeah. you mentioned could be a way to pay them or convince them to uh, work their while and see um, what it produces. Mm -hmm. And actually, that brings up like a side channel that was happening on Twitter because I saw uh, people like Jesse Stommel and a few others talking about um, when we're getting students to do work that has real value in the real world, mm -hmm. and yet and if we're asking them to do it for free, but we wouldn't do that ourselves, then it's is a, that a form of exploitation? Yeah. What's, what's yeah, the yeah, behind that? I was wondering if that was exploitation by mm -hmm. like paying them through that, but. Yeah, so there was this whole other Twitter thing I couldn't follow mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, did, I saw just a teeny bit of that. Mm -hmm. Would it be that if they're doing it for credit, it's like one of their assignments in class, is that okay? It seems like they're getting yeah. something. Yeah. Where do you draw? Yeah. Yeah. I come and play my house. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually is part of the work, right? It helps. It helps them. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Obviously, you can go too far and you can ask them to write an entire textbook for you. And, <laughs> but I mean, just a little learning object. <laughs> but I, I totally agree. I think we, we can easily move into exploitation territory. Yeah, it seems as though that would be, you know, uh, also bearing in mind that lots of kids at school are now, be, are now creating stuff. That's part of the pedagogy in school. So they're coming through to universities with those skills as well, being able to create different learning objects. I have to agree that writing a whole textbook for you is probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're paying them. Unless you're paying them. Paying them would be great. Yes. Yeah, well, Robin did. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
So the Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> Do a Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> How much money is out there? Four hundred bucks. Four hundred. The pitiful DeRosa grant. The PDG. Four hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. I'm going to excuse myself because I have to go and start the session for half an hour from now. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was really nice to meet you. Okay. See you soon. Quick plug. Just happy birthday to my daughter, Alice. I want to say this live. <laughs> She's two today. Happy birthday. Aww. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Wasn't she one of the ritual buttons? <laughs> <laughs> we are pressing against time, so. Yes, we, yes, we're aware of that. So if you guys have to uh, deke out to the next section, session or even just grab a break, um, you're welcome to. And then those of us left behind, we can continue to chat. Um, some good conversations happening at Open Ed. In the open. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks Helen. Thanks.